At exactly 4 a.m. on the 6th of November 2020, a face-off between King Vaughn and Quando Rondo in downtown Atlanta changed the trajectory of their lives forever. Vaughn was unlucky that night. Three bullets from Quando's homie Lul Tim ensured that the Chicago rapper was put to sleep, marking a permanent end to his rap career and his run on earth. Quando, on the other hand, lived to tell the tale. But if you know anything about Quando's life, if you've been following him closely and you know what he's been through since Vaughn's passing, then you know calling him lucky will make you the biggest troll right now. Quando has been through the blender, from being hip-hop's most hated man of 2020, to strapping up bulletproof vests before every performance after the fact, to having a million dollar bounty placed on his head. This is the craziness that's been going on inside Quando Rondo's scary life since King Von's passing. So it's all I got business. a crazy story, man. All right, yeah, see? When he is at the airport, some tall ass, he like seven feet. He see Durky, Durky, yo. <laughs> now, now that was crazy. <laughs> When you find yourself in the middle of a murder case, when you look down and you see blood on your hands, it don't matter whether it was in self-defense or not. Best believe that you've just acquired a new set of ops. Ops that most definitely won't rest until you're as past tense as the person you allegedly took from them. That was the pickle that Quando found himself in the immediate aftermath of King Von's death. It didn't matter that he wasn't the one that pulled the trigger. It didn't matter that Vaughn was the one that pulled the first punch. It also didn't matter that Lil' Tim pulling up for Quando could be chalked down to self-defense for anyone remotely familiar with Vaughn's street cred. All that mattered was that Vaughn was dead, and the person everyone wanted to blame was Rondo. So when a rumor started making the rounds that the Savannah rapper had a million dollar hit on his head, people weren't all too shocked. But was it true? Well, 14 days after Vaughn's passing, we heard from the horse's mouth himself when on the 20th of November, Quando released a song ominously titled End of Story. First off, he addressed his silence on the matter with the lyrics. Sometimes the best response is none at all. You probably would have left your mans. That ain't 100, dog. Quando had not said a word about Vaughn in those 14 days after the rapper's demise. And while many OGs felt it was a respectful thing to do, they had no clue who Quando was or how he moved. Because in this same song, Quando would come for the fans. Next with the verse, see nowadays, it's like the fans doing the police job, y'all talk that gangsta but cry when it get knocked, you pose to walk it how you talk it, but I still ain't got my point across, and you can't blame the man. Immediately after Vaughn passed, the fans came for him like a mob thirsty for blood. They wanted the homie dead. But it wasn't just the fans, though, as he would reveal in the lyrics, someone had put a million dollar bounty on his head. A million on my head, that's what they say. That's all you got. Make it eight, come run up on me, bite the bait, slash a million dollars. That's a lot of money to put on anyone's head. I don't care who you are. If it ain't John Wick, then you're tripping. But there's money to burn in the game. And Vaughn had as many ops as he had homies. If that figure was real, it was more about what Vaughn meant to the person that set the price of the bounty than what Quando's life was worth. So who set the price? Well, it had to be someone close to Vaughn. And for most with ears on the streets, for them, it just had to be Lil Durk. You see, King Vaughn was Lil Durk's cousin. And Vaughn was also signed to Durk's label. They were tight. So in the aftermath of his cousin's death, it made sense for fans to think that Dirk was pissed. It made sense for everyone to believe Dirk would want revenge. It made sense that he was the one who set the bounty. But if you know Dirk, then you know he don't talk much. And on Vaughn's demise, Dirk didn't move any differently. He definitely didn't say anything about the rumor. He didn't deny it. And of course, he didn't admit to it. And before anyone comes running to Dirk's defense saying Dirk ain't like that or Dirk wouldn't do that, you must know that Vaughn, his cousin, had placed a $100,000 bounty on FBG Duck's head before the latter's tragic demise. I'm taking this straight out out of FBI documents. This is not hearsay. So in a way, you could argue that this kind of behavior was not above Dirk. Now, whether it was true or not, whoever was trying to cash that million dollar check was sloppy, extremely sloppy. I'm signed, though. I wish that ain't missed your mouth. Yeah, he shouldn't have. That's what cost. <laughs> Shit, fuck no, <laughs> Hey, dope. Hey, what they about us, though? We don't do like, no missing. This exchange between Quando, Lil Pab, and OTF's very own Lil Varney makes sense if you are familiar with Varney's dentition. But what's more important in this clip I showed you was the last words from Quando. Hey, dope. Hey, what they about us, though? We don't do no missing. Yes, it was a jab to Vaughn's people. And yes, he was referring to the fact that his homie Lil' Tim shot him dead. But before you go out on a limb to call this line out of pocket, you gotta know that there was an attempt on his life two months before this clubhouse discourse. It happened on the 2nd of May, 
2021. It was Kwando's first show after King Von's demise. It had already been six months, and this show was coming off the back of a previous show. He had the weekend of Von's passing that got canceled for obvious reasons. Kwando called Cap on this and said nothing got canceled. But hey, who knows? Now, Kwando was slated to perform in Georgia in front of a small crowd with all of his homies on stage with him. And by small, I mean around 500 or less. Regardless of the numbers, everything went well. Right up to midnight, there was no trouble, no issues, nothing. Then two hours after midnight, at exactly 2.20 a.m., Quando and his homies were at a convenience store when a car pulled up and fired multiple shots at Quando and his crew. One man was hitting the arm or something, but that was that. He was taken to the hospital, and he got better. Now, do those last words from the clubhouse rant make sense? If it were Vaughn's crew, Dirk's crew, or some opportunist looking to snatch the million-dollar bag, they just embarrassed themselves and indirectly disrespected Vaughn's murderous legacy. Because trust Quando. He used it as an opportunity to throw more dirt on the dead rapper's name. And that's a fact, Matt, because the main's gone. Main's gone. And that's a fact, Matt, because they main's gone. Now, you got to know that I ain't taking sides here. This kind of flex is weird. And it don't matter who they say Vaughn was. If someone tried to kill you and you survived, you strap up, keep your mouth shut, and stay vigilant. But Quando did the exact opposite of that. And there were consequences for it devastating consequences. Right now, the search is on for three people who police say shot at a Savannah rapper, killing a member of his entourage. It happened in Los Angeles and cameras captured the aftermath. This was the second attempt on Quando's life after Vaughn's passing. The month was August 19th, 2022. More than a year had passed since the clubhouse clowning, and there had been a lot of disses, a lot of snide remarks, and a clear lack of remorse on Quando's side for his part in Vaughn's demise. You could say he didn't owe anyone nothing since Vaughn was his op, but there was reckoning to be reckoned, and word on the street the bounty was still up. On that day, the 19th of August, Quando was with his cousin, Lul Pab, in West Hollywood. Lul Pab had gotten into hot water with 12 about some RICO charges back in 2019, and he also had some more charges leveled against him because he had tried to flee the police after the fact. Pab was gonna plead guilty and serve his time. That was the plan. And knowing this, this was the last time in a long time Quando would have an intimate one-on-one -on -one interaction with his cuz while the young man was still free. He was right, a little too right, because that was the last time he would ever see his cuz alive. According to reports, Quando and Pab were in a Cadillac Escalade when they pulled up to a gas station across from the Beverly Center at around a 11.30 a.m. Out of nowhere, a white four-door sedan pulled alongside their whip, and three people got out of the sedan and opened fire on them. Quando was the target, but it was Pab that caught the bullets. Quando didn't even get a scratch. The sloppy assassins had once again messed up the hit, but this time, there wasn't going to be laughs or weird songs about their sloppiness. In the meantime, and immediately after the shooting, Quando hopped in the driver's seat, drove two blocks away from the scene before flagging down a sheriff's deputy. Shots fired, a fight taken to the streets, and this chaotic scene the ending of a shooting that started in Los Angeles, California. Sheriff's deputies pulling out a man who had been shot in an SUV. A rapper, Quando Rondo, a passenger in that car, frantic at the sight. At this point, love him or hate to see a man scream in agony like that. At the loss of a cousin, that shit's gotta hurt. But everyone not on Quando's group chat would also say that's how Lil Dirk must have felt when Vaughn was taken out. They would say, now he knows how Dirk felt. Meanwhile, Vaughn's crew O'Block and the Black Disciples members thought they had gotten Rondo. The story goes that they were celebrating his death. But their excitement ended when Quando's aunt posted an update on her Instagram stories that called Cap on their assumptions. She said, I love everyone, but please give my family time to call me. You guys are clogging in my line. We're fine. Maybe I should reword it. He's fine. I spoke with him myself. So Quando was still alive. Were they going to try again? Or were they just going to let the homie live out his days in peace? Peace? Very funny. At this point, I got to let you in on a little something. Quando's ops weren't the only ones trying to take him out. Believe it or not, the rapper was after his own life. A month before the tragic yet botched hit, his own body almost went on a permanent lockdown. Quando announced on Instagram that he was in a hospital fighting for his life after overdosing on lean, a concoction of prescription codeine and a soft drink. The deadly cocktail triggered acute kidney failure in the young rapper, and he almost died. It was just one issue after the other with this guy. His ops weren't letting him off easy. He wasn't letting himself off easy, and as if life wasn't hard enough, the police were also after him. Well known Savannah rapper Aquando Rondo is in jail this morning after he was arrested in a sweeping indictment. 
It's one thing to battle your ops. It's another thing to go toe to toe against yourself and your destructive addictions. But to have 12 knocking on your door on top of all that is a whole different ball game and one that most rappers wouldn't want to play. But nature's a bitch. And Quando, along with most rappers, are slaves to their nature. Because if you'd been on the outside following Rondo closely on the gram, his sudden arrest would have knocked your socks off. Why? Well, because back in September of 2022, Rondo had taken to his IG story to denounce his affiliation with the Rolling 60s neighborhood Crips. This came immediately after the death of Lil Pab. Now, it could have been emotions messing up his head, but he suspected that somebody from the gang might have been responsible for Pab's death. However, he was not going to get off easy, because as you probably already know, the gang has a rule for gang exits, which basically says, blood in, blood out. In simpler terms, if he was going to leave, he would have to get jumped by fellow gang members. But, and this is where things get dangerous, Rondo made it abundantly clear in that IG story that he had no intention of getting jumped by disloyal gang members. What can I I say. It's like Quando had an addiction to collecting ops like Pokemon cards. Now, Quando might have deleted the post soon after, but by that time, the damage was done. And soon enough, word had gone round that he was exiting NH on his own terms. This act of rebellion got OGs within the gang buzzing. And soon enough, rappers like Jay Stone had chipped in their own two cents. You can't drop your flag and say you not NH no mo, Jay Sent wrote on his IG story. Go to the hood and get your put off. Don't cry now. We lose homies all the time. Not everybody gonna ride. You was a goofy internet banger anyway. As you would expect, Quando's response to this OG was anything but respectful. In a mocking IG post, he said, Before you go to talking about another, sit back and think like I don't even got 200 bands because you need way more than that to stand with me. Was this a direct result of his emotional state at the time or was he just spazzing out because that's the Rondo way? I argue it was a little bit of both. But while you and I can rationalize Quando's behavior and remarks, the police were having none of that. In fact, they were not only insisting that the rapper was a criminal. According to them, he was the leader of the whole gang. Wild, right? Emma, in my hand is the 17 page, 49 count indictment laying out the charges against Quando Rondo and 18 others that they are facing this morning. The rapper whose real name is Ty Quinn Bowman is accused of being the leader of the Rolling 60s gang here in Savannah. Turns out the legs behind that claim had to do with an incident in a movie theater from a little while back where Quando saw members of the rival 1100 gang in attendance. He then told his own gang members, the Rolling 60s, to get guns. This inciting, potentially dangerous behavior was what led them to believe that he was the gang's leader, at least in his neighborhood. How true this is, is anyone's guess. But that's not all they had on Rondo. Quando also had another two counts of conspiracy to violate Georgia's Controlled Substances Act. One count of participating in criminal street gang activity and use of a communication facility in the commission of a felony involving controlled substances. They cited a specific incident where Quando allegedly traveled to Macon in Georgia as recently as June 4th of 2023 to pay a supplier for marijuana. And again, it's not just hearsay. Prosecutors have recordings of Quando Rondo negotiating a drug deal with a supplier before he traveled to Macon to pay off said supplier. Now, this might not be a RICO indictment, but Quando still has hell to pay if he's found guilty. We want to remind you a new Georgia law is cracking down on gang involvement. It adds a mandatory five-year prison sentence for anyone convicted of a gang crime and 10 years for those convicted of recruiting minors into a gang. So there's a strong possibility Quando could do 15 years behind bars. And it's like Quando knew this level of trouble was on the horizon because moments before his arrest, he sent out a tweet where he was basically just loving on his family. He's currently battling his charges, even though he's out on bail. The judge set it at $100,000 and he paid it. But this is not where Quando's story ends. This is not where the video ends. Why? Well, because we haven't answered a very important question. I know we've already gone through and stated the facts. Quando Rondo's life has been a living hell since the death of Vaughn. Some of it was his own making. Some you could give it up to Vaughn's crew, and a good sum of it all has come from 12. But there's one question that we've skipped, a question that desperately needs answering, and it has to do with the fact that Quando is still alive. Why? Now make no mistake, I'm not wishing the rapper dead or any of that. The less bloodshed we have on the streets, the better. But what's so special about this man? How has he been able to survive the impossible? You gotta have some special kind of juju to survive two drive-bys, an overdose, and still run your mouth recklessly like Quando does. So what's the homie's secret? Well, questions like that 
that require digging to find answers. And in my exploration of Kwando's past, I found that all of the smoke that came post Vaughn was not new to the 24-year-old rapper. In fact, remove the Vaughn altercation, and I'd argue that this man would still have the two drive-bys under his belt, along with every other issue he had. What I'm saying is that if Vaughn's crew hadn't tried to take him out twice, someone else eventually would have. Because right from when he was a kid, the young rapper had been skipping between his violent nature and his musical talent. Young Kwando was in from before he was a teenager. From 11 till 16 or so, he was government property. This kind of life came after he had run away from a good home when he was a kid. But that home wasn't his home. Because as he would reveal in an interview with DJ Vlad, Kwando was taken away from his parents by Child Protective Services after an incident with an iron while his parents were arguing. They took him to the hospital, but it didn't help that his mother was hooked on drugs at the time. Eventually, he lived with an aunt, but she was too religious for him, so he took to the streets. During this time, he was couch hopping between relatives while his father was sent to the pen. So eventually, the rapper grew up without a father figure. Meanwhile, he became one with the streets, committing crimes. And it was those crimes that he committed while on the streets that landed him in juvie. But while he was in juvie, Kwando's talent came to confront his violent nature. It was kind of like the light confront the dark within him. I used to take my mattress out the bed, he said, and beat on the metal. And it seemed like the metal give you a little flow. He was a natural with something to give the world. And even though he was behind bars, it didn't take long for his talent to bring him fame amongst his peers. In fact, he got so popular that when he got out of juvie, he was hearing peeps on the street singing his music. That was all the validation the rapper needed to start taking his music seriously. Soon enough, he attracted the attention of Lil Baby, who got on his I Remember track that went on to rack 10s of millions of views on YouTube. He dropped a mixtape with a title that was prophetic at the time, Life Before Fame. And within two days, his mixtape had amassed more than one million streams. A month after, Young Boy had signed him, and on the surface, it looked like the Savannah rapper was destined for stadium heights, a life amongst the stars. But those who knew him close enough would tell you that Quando kept getting in Quando's way. And you mustn't forget that all of this was happening before the Vaughn shooting. As Rondo started getting into the system, he quickly found himself at odds with everybody within the system. His violent nature was struggling to cannibalize his talent. And when a homie as young as Rondo, who had no father figure or mentor to call him out or show him the way, started mixing with industry homies, he lost the script very quickly. He was fighting everybody, even his fans. <laughs> It happened incredibly fast, but that right there is the moment when Kwando spat on one of his fans while at a concert he was performing at. When he was asked why he did it, he said the lady spat at him first, but he was the one who got into the crowd in the first place, looking for a fight. And this was right after his boss, Young Boy, had also gotten into a fight with the same crowd. But hey, I guess you inherit your boss's enemies, right? Even if it's a crowd of several thousand angry fans who could stomp you to death in a few seconds. Now that beef was crazy in itself and brought a lot of legal trouble for the homie, but it's his beef with Kodak that was probably the most publicized and hilarious. And it wasn't like they started out beefing. In the beginning, Kodak and Kwando were collaborators working on the tracks Chosen One and Water in 2017. I don't know if they were friends, but I've never heard of Ops getting on a track together. Maybe you have. Now, there were two ways they could have settled this beef. They could either slug it out on the streets or attack themselves on a track like proper artists. Kodak, who was already in a lot of legal issues at the time, chose the latter. So if they were friends before, it all changed when Kodak released his single time never mattered. And you want to know the funny part? Kodak didn't even name Kwando. He went after Young Boy and his label as a whole. But I hope that I don't go broke again. I'm killing young babies. Kodak never going broke again. Are you a free agent? No one talked about it. No one commented on the rumors directly, but fans believed Young Boy responded to Kodak's jabs on Time Never. Mattered in a video on YouTube. I, I, I don't like you. I'm gonna keep on that. I don't like you. Then it was Kwando's turn, and he added to the beef in the most Rondo way possible. The Savannah rapper escalated matters by filming himself burning merch for Kodak's label Sniper Gang. The video sparked outrage among Kodak's circle, causing them to retaliate by burning a Never Broken Again LLC shirt. Then guns were introduced into the convo when Kodak's Sniper Gang crew sent out a clip on social media where they were showing off their rifles and making threats toward Kwando Rondo. The threat went something like this, y'all burning Sniper Gang sh I usually don't burn shirts, you feel me? I really burn asses. You feel me? It kept on escalating till Kwando chose to get Kodak's signature haircut in an obvious troll. It was the ultimate sign of disrespect. And by now, you should have gotten your answer. The answer to why Kwando Rondo is still alive. That Kodak hair stunt alone is all the insight you need to get a sense of Kwando's character. The feud, the fight, the violence. It's all a game to him. You've seen it too often. We've all seen it since the music genre was created. A promising talent gets taken over by gangster culture and his career ends in ruin. It's what took out both Biggie and Pac. 
that. But with Quando, things might be just a little different. Because while gangbangers like Vaughn, Biggie, and even Pac took the violence seriously, it seems like this is all a game to Quando Rondo. Let me put it like this. If Vaughn was some evil version of Batman, Quando Rondo was and still is the Joker. And that's why his list of ops reads like fan fiction. NLE Choppa, Kodak Black, Kevin Gates. Come on, man. Hey, bro, come on now, dog. And it's like the industry knows. I don't think anyone would be wrong to assume that's why they were hella quick to turn their back on Rondo immediately after the King Von incident. Just take a look at the rapper. His music career has been on a decline ever since. And if he isn't careful, if he doesn't tread lightly, strap up, and keep his mouth shut, he might find himself caught lacking. And he better pray that whoever catches him lacking doesn't send him six feet under to meet Vaughn and all the other fallen rappers. If you found this insight into Quando's life exciting, click a video on your screen for more crazy deep dives into your favorite rapper just like this one.